The first of our three speakers is Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs. You can find an extended biographical note in your program, and I will not embarrass the Chief Rabbi by repeating all the encomiums contained therein, including his having been made a life peer and member of the House of Lords. I will say, however, that I have over the years observed the Chief Rabbi in many different situations, and he has an uncanny ability at all times to know what the Lord doth require of him, but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with his God. Please join me in welcoming Lord Jonathan Sachs, Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the British Commonwealth. Uh, friends, um, David asks, am I correct? To which the answer is an unequivocal yes and no. <laughs> but David, you have set us on the right path because you have told us that you're unhappy. <laughs> and for a Jew to be happy is to have something to be unhappy about. <laughs> If I were to sum up purely philosophically for a moment the Jewish attitude to happiness, I would say it is this. Um, it is Max Goldberg, who in his 70s suffers a problem with his heart, is immediately rushed into the hospital that I am told is the best in the United States, Massachusetts General, he is there for seven days. And after seven days in this magnificent hospital, he checks himself out and goes to a very rundown Jewish hospital in New York's Lower East Side. And the doctor is just fascinated to know why did he leave this magnificent hospital to come to this rundown place? And he says, Goldberg, tell me, Goldberg, what was the matter there? The doctors, didn't they understand your condition? And Goldberg says, the doctors double Einsteins. About the doctors, I can't complain. Was it the nurses? Didn't they look after you? About the nurses, angels in human form. About the nurses, I can't complain. So what was it, Goldberg? The food. Didn't you like the food? Goldberg said, the food, manna from heaven. About the food, I can't complain. So Goldberg, why did you leave there and come here? And Goldberg, with a big smile, says, because here I can complain. <laughs> all of this <laughs> all of this leads a French contemporary scholar Esther Ben Bassa I think her name is to write a book about contemporary Jewish life entitled published this earlier this year Suffering as Identity and uh, it is that very negative approach to life which has dominated Jewish life in recent decades, not, not unsurprisingly after two centuries of anti-Semitism culminating in the Holocaust. But my latest book, Future Tense, uh, actually says this is the wrong road to go down. <laughs> so friends, what I'm going to do very simply is to say this. Um, as uh, David has, uh, si since uh, uh, John is here, sorry, I should say before I say anything else, if heaven is anything like the Emory University Center for Law and Religion, I will be happy in the world <laughs> to come. So John, thank you for all you've done for <clears throat> it's very interesting. The first word of the book of Psalms is ashray, which means happy. But it's a very interesting word. There's no English equivalent because ashray is a plural construct. It doesn't mean happy. It means these are the happinesses of. As if in that first word, already to hint to us that there may be many forms of happiness in Judaism. And there are indeed. And I'm only going to look at three. One, which I think David will 
uh, meet you halfway a form of happiness, or at least of existence in Judaism, that is radically different from the kind of life that we hear from the Dalai Lama. That is the first. The second will be one that is very similar to that advocated by the Dalai Lama. And the third will be one on which I believe our various traditions can converge, as it were, from different starting points. So let me begin by saying, and of course David is right, happiness is not the core concept in Judaism. We do not hold like Aristotle that it is that at which all things aim. In Judaism, we would sum up Judaism as life, liberty, and the pursuit of holiness, not happiness. And, uh, and that, incidentally, is not an unsound way of proceeding because, as I mentioned yesterday, and as many thinkers have realized from Aristotle to what's Mr. Flo, Mihaly, Csikszent Mihaly, yeah? Mr. Peak experiences, you do not arrive at happiness by pursuing it directly. And that is how Maimonides defines in the 10th chapter of Hilchus Tshuva, what is Ha'oved et Hashem Ehava, somebody who serves God with love in his fine words, Oseh Ahmed, Mibnei Shehu Ahmed, he does what is right because it is right, Vesofatova Lavo, and the happiness will come. So happiness is part of Judaism, but it is not that at which we aim. Now, the first thing that is very obvious is that you read the Bible, happiness is not something you necessarily associate with the biblical heroes, the heroes of the religious imagination in Judaism. They struggle, they wrestle, they argue, they contend. They fight with the people for the sake of God. They fight with God for the sake of the people. At least four biblical heroes pray to God to die. Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, and Jonah. And of course, Job likewise. The figures of the Bible know exile and no persecution. They know defeat, but they know happiness, all too rarely. Nowhere is there a more ironic word in Hebrew than the name of the first Jewish child, Isaac. The Hebrew means Yitzchak, he will laugh. And yet Isaac's life is not full of laughter. As a child, he sees a father who is prepared to sacrifice him. As a father himself, he sees his two sons engage in sibling rivalry and is deceived by one of them. So in Judaism, happiness is at the end of a long and winding road. When, in the 20th century, the late Rabbi Soloveitchik spoke of Jewish life, he spoke of it as thesis and antithesis without the mediating synthesis. When a contemporary Talmudic scholar, Adin Steinsaltz, wrote a book about Jewish life, he called it strife of the spirit. The Talmud says that sages have no rest neither in this world nor the next. So I think we can say this, that uh, there is a very, very beautiful image of happiness as being at one with the universe. But that is not the Jewish way. In Judaism, at least in the mainstream, Judaism is a religion of active engagement with the world driven by the cognitive dissonance between the world that is and the world that ought to be. Judaism lives in that dissonance. We live in this world, but we know just how far from the ideal it is, and all our actions are intended to reduce that distance between the is and the ought. However, I want to say this, that there is a kind of happiness in all of this. Think of Abraham, the grandfather of the world's three great Abrahamic monotheism, think of his life. He has to tear himself away from everything that makes somebody feel at home in the world. He has to leave behind his land, his birthplace, his father's house, and travel 
to, says God, the land will, which I will show you. As soon as he arrives in the land, there's a famine and he has to leave. Twice his life is in danger and Sarah has to pretend she's his sister rather than his wife because he's afraid they'll kill him. God promises him children, as many as the stars of the sky, as the grains of sand on the seashore. He has to wait till he's an old man before he has even one child. God promises, Arise, walk through the land, the length, the breadth thereof. I give it all to you. And when Sarah dies, he does not have one square inch that he can call his own in which to bury her. And he has to pay an inflated price for the burial plot. And yet, at the end of his life, the Bible says, and Abraham died, of good old age, Zaken Vesaver, old and satisfied with life. One of the most serene deaths in the Bible. There is a kind of happiness in all this. It is not happiness written by Johann Sebastian Bach. This is happiness at which Beethoven arrived at the very end of his life in those late string quartets. Or uh, to take a non-musical analogy, you know, when, when, uh, when, when I uh, went to study philosophy at Cambridge, uh, the invisible hero, he died more than a decade earlier, uh, was Ludwig Wittgenstein. Now, Wittgenstein was a serious depressive. Three of his siblings committed suicide. His whole life was spent in anguish and self-doubt. You know, he once said to Bertrand Russell, Russell, tell me, am I a complete idiot or not? If I'm a complete idiot, I'll study aeronautical engineering. <laughs> if I'm not, I'll study philosophy. I mean, you know, I love Bertrand Russell, you know, he was so un-Jewish, you know. <laughs> Bertrand Russell once said about G.E. Moore, I only once her G.E. Moore tell a lie. And that's when I asked him, Moore, have you ever told a lie? And he said, yes. <laughs> Sorry, okay. That's what you get by studying philosophy. Anyway, so, so Wittgenstein, you know, just even to think straight, has to leave Cambridge, go to a little fjord in Norway, in total isolation. This man, I actually had my room in Cambridge, oh, just above his doctor's surgery where, where, where he died. Wittgenstein's last words were tell them I've had a wonderful life. Can you understand? I think, I, I think one can. So that is the first kind of happiness that I associate with Judaism, which is so radically unlike you know, the serene Buddhist happiness. It is the happiness, not of being at peace in the universe, but the happiness that comes from challenge, struggle, sometimes sacrifice for high ideals, a life that has its setbacks and its moments of despair, uh, those moments that you hear so ab absolutely in Moses, in Jeremiah. The point, you know, for, for, for me as a Jew, the point in the New Testament that, that speaks most closely as a Jew, is the last words of Jesus when he is quoting the Targum, the Aramaic translation of Psalm 22, Eli, Eli, lama zavachtani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a really Jewish moment. The, the, you find God in the very act of asking, of doubting, of questioning. And there is, I think, a certain kind of, uh, it's what Herbert Schneider once famously called sacred discontent. Uh, anyone know of a, a guy called Bob Geldof who used to do this? You, you come across this man? Oh, sorry, do you, you don't want the Bible according to Bob Geldof. All right, we'll move on. Anyway, so there it is. So there is, I think, fulfillment, vividness, passion in the struggle and moments of exhilaration. You hear that exhilaration in the song, the Israelites sing as they cross the Red Sea. And that is, I think, a certain kind of happiness in Judaism. Um, uh, happiness is struggle. It, is, it comes in that last, 
in those last moments of life where you look back and you say, you know, in the words of Rabbi Tarfan, it is not for you to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it, from having taken part in the struggle, knowing that you struggled in a noble cause. That's happiness one. There is a second kind of happiness in Judaism, and I call this the happiness of the wisdom tradition in Judaism, the happiness you find in the book of Proverbs, in some of the Psalms, and so on and so forth. And that kind of happiness is, comes closest to the kind of happiness of which the Dalai Lama speaks, and with shaded variations, the kind of happiness at which the various strands of the Greek philosophical tradition also spoke. That is a happiness of balance, of virtue, of compassion, of living well and faring well. That kind of osher, that kind of osher is the happiness of one who is good, who does good, who has been blessed in life, and who has been held in high regard. And that is the happiness set forth for us in Psalm 1. Happy is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. That's happiness as rootedness. You know, there's something very interesting in Hebrew, the word secular. Where does the word secular come from? Seculum, meaning this worldly. Would, would that be about right? In Hebrew, the word for secular is chol. And chol is the Hebrew for sand. Why? Because sand gets blown by the wind. You're not rooted anywhere. And that is exactly what Psalm 1 says. Lokein harashayim, the wicked aren't like the righteous. Ki im kamot they're like the chaff that the wind blows away. So this happiness as rootedness uh, and a giving forth fruit and all that kind of thing. And, and that is the happiness of the wisdom tradition. Of course, the most remarkable account, very complex account of this kind of happiness, it is challenging and it is very subversive, is the happiness mentioned in the book, which you quoted, the book of Kohelet of Ecclesiastes. Who is Ecclesiastes? The man who has everything. He has a wardrobe full of Armani suits, a garage full of Lamborghinis. He does the shopping in the Lamborghini. He has a second home in the south of France. You name it. What else do you have to have in order to be Ecclesiastes? And of course, as you will know, having a garage full of Lamborghinis yourself, that, that does not buy you happiness. And there he is saying, you know, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. And uh, I just want to uh, I, I be tiny bit homiletical here, because let's do a little bit of stuff that actually works in life. I once was able to decode Ecclesiastes, because the first, when I was a student in 1968, and for the first time I met a man who had great influence on my life, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schnirsen, the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, and I was just about to go in to see him, and his followers told me a lovely story which I share with you. Somebody had written to the Rebbe, you know, he was a great holy man, Somebody had written to the rabbi, I need the rabbi's help. I am deeply depressed. I can hardly find the will to go on living. I pray and I am not moved. I fulfill the commands and yet I feel no satisfaction. I need the rabbi's help. And the rabbi who used, before he was a leader of the Jewish people, ran a publishing house and so was used to using typographical symbols, sent him the most brilliant reply and it did not use a single word. He simply ringed the first word in every sentence. The first word in every sentence was I. If you want to know why you're miserable, because you start every sentence with the word I. And uh, it's exactly as, uh, as John said yesterday, the truth is, as Viktor Frankl always used to say in the name of Kierkegaard, the door to happiness opens outward. You have to, uh, you have to uh, abandon the I and focus on the you, on the other. And if you actually look, and this gets a little bit diluted in English, 
But if you look at the Hebrew of the first two chapters of the book of Ecclesiastes, there is no other book in the Bible that uses the first person singular so much. Banitili, asitili, kanitili, each one of those is a double I. I made for myself, I bought for myself, I acquired for myself, I planted for myself. It's all for myself. And that is why he does not find happiness. And eventually, exactly as you said, David, he finds happiness in the now, in love, in work. Sweet is the sleep of a laboring man. Uh, rejoice with the woman you've taken. In eat, he even finds uh, he even finds a bit of Epicurean happiness in eating and drinking, and a touch of the Robin Williams in Dead Poets Society. You know, carpe diem, in, rejoice in your Creator in the days of your youth, etc., etc. So that is the wisdom tradition. It is the most universal. It is there in ancient Egyptian wisdom literature, it's in the whole philosophical tradition of the Greek, Greeks uh, in different ways, in Aristotle, the Stoics, the Epicureans, and others, and almost all the great religious traditions. It comes in many shapes and sizes. Some are more this-worldly, others are less this-worldly, but that is the life of balance and beauty and great goodness and virtue and order and inner peace, which is the exact opposite of the first kind of happiness, which is a life of struggle and passion. And that is another version of happiness in Judaism. Do not believe that there is only one way to live a good and happy life, even within a single tradition. So that's number two. Um, and finally, number three, the point that I just hinted at yesterday, the point where I think we can converge whatever our tradition. And that is what I called um, social happiness. And it is far too little spoken about nowadays. This is a rare idea. And this comes from the concept of covenant. Social happiness comes from the concept of covenant. And covenant itself comes out of the paradox set forth with beautiful clarity in the first three chapters of the book of Genesis. On the one hand, the human being is supremely valuable. Every one of us, regardless of color, class, culture, gender, every one of us is in the image and likeness of God. This, I think, the singular, most single radical assertion of monotheism, as if discovering God singular and alone, humanity found the human person singular and alone. Only in monotheism do you get the birth of the individual as having ultimate significance. Set against that is, and again in Hebrew this is, it's, it's, it's like a discord in the middle of a Mozart symphony. Because we have had Genesis 1, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. And suddenly, seven times, and suddenly in Genesis 2, we hear the words, not good. The words not good only appear twice in the whole of the Pentateuch. What is not good? It is not good for man to be alone. So on the one hand, this almost infinite dignity of the human individual, but on the other hand, the inadequacy of the human individual... And out of that tension, the whole human drama, as conceived by Judaism, that the whole drama is generated by that one single paradox, which mean, to sum up what the problem is, how do we construct relationships of trust that are not relationships of dominance? How do we establish human bonds based on the recognition of the independence and integrity of the other? And that is the problem whose solution is covenant. Covenant is a moral commitment in which two individuals or more, each respecting the dignity and independence of the other, come together in a bond of love and trust to do together what neither can do alone. And the paradigm case of that is marriage. And the most daring 
really audacious proposition of the Hebrew Bible is that the relationship between God and humanity is just that, the relationship of a marriage. It sounds sacrilegious, blasphemous. What is there that God cannot do alone? But there is, of course, one thing God cannot do alone, which is to live within the human heart. For that, he needs our partnership. And this generates a third form of happiness, which is not the struggle, form one. It's not being at peace with yourself, form two. This form of happiness is all about relationships. The quality and depth of our relationships with the other, with the human other, and the divine other, which is God. And the Bible sees this kind of happiness not just as a personal matter, but essential to the health of a society as a whole. In other words, a society is made by the extent to which husbands and wives, parents and children, communities, and ultimately a whole society can achieve that happiness based on relationships of mutual respect and mutual responsibility. And the Bible says something astonishing. It really is astonishing. You, you, you kind of miss it if you're not concentrating. And here it is. We have two passages of curses in the, in the Mosaic books. One at the end of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 26. The other towards the end of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28. Terrifying, terrifying literature of curses. The one in Leviticus happens because of national apostasy. You, you reject me, says God. You abandon me. You treat me uh, uh, negligently. So I will abandon you. That's big time national apostasy. What is remarkable about Deuteronomy is there's no apostasy. The only reason the curses happen is because you did not serve God with joy, and gladness of heart, out of the abundance of all good things. It is a stunning insight. A society that loses the art of happiness is a society on the brink of decline. And that makes happiness a social and, in the broadest possible sense, a political issue. So, I think what, uh, and let us just chase that for one moment. We'll, we'll do it very quickly. What does social happiness entail? First of all, um, can I just point out one feature of the Bible, which I think is tremendously important, which is that the book of Genesis comes before the book of Exodus. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> what do I mean? Uh, and, and Christians should see this much more readily than Jews, because in the Christian Bible, the book of Ruth appears before the first book of Samuel, right? And it's very interesting. In the Hebrew Bible, the book of Ruth appears nowhere near the book of Samuel. Uh, but the Christian Bible gets it in the chronological order. What is Exodus about? The birth of Israel as a nation. What is the first book of Samuel about? The birth of Israel as a kingdom. They are both political moments. But what is Genesis about? Human relationships. It's about husbands and wives, parents and children, siblings and their rivalry, about Abraham and Sarah and, 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 and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Rachel and Leah. That's what it's about, personal relationships. The Bible tells us the story of the personal relationship before it begins to talk about the political phenomenon, phenomena of the book of Exodus. Ditto with 1 Samuel, which talks about the birth of Israel's monarchy, first Saul, then David. It tells us the story of Ruth. Of the kind, what's the phrase, that lovely phrase? The kindness of strangers. Of Ruth's attachment to Naomi and Boaz's kindness to both of them. 
And right at the end of the book of Ruth comes the punchline that Ruth is, in fact, the great grandmother of King David, Israel's greatest kings. The Torah is telling us something extremely important, the primacy of the personal over the political. Do not expect to create a happy society simply by political institutions, which of necessity use force, coercive power, that's what politics is about, the primacy of the personal over the political. Uh, so, oh, okay. Oh, I like that. You have made somebody very happy. Thank you. Okay, that's number one. Number two, uh, a fundamental Jewish distinction, as you know, it follows from this is that happiness is to be found down here in the here and now, in this world, in this life, in the physical universe that God created in seven times called God good. It is here in this embodied existence, that wonderful mix, as the Bible calls it, of dust of the earth and breath of God. In other words, Judaism rejects a whole tradition in religion, Gnosticism, Manichaeism, even Platonism, that sharp separation of body and soul, the physical, the spiritual, the time and the eternity, the particular and the universal. Happiness is down here in the particularity of our embodied existence. And that's, that's uh, and, and, uh, and uh, it was the late Sidney Morgan Besser, if I'm not mistaken, professor of philosophy at Columbia, who once proved how useless Platonism can be in the real world. You know Plato's theory of forms that the reality is not all these particulars down here, it's the form of things up there. He took his philosophy students to a restaurant in the Lower East Side, he called over the waiter and said, waiter, I'd like to order soup. So the waiter said, yeah, well, pea soup, chicken soup, we have a wonderful borscht. None of those, says Morgan Besser, I just want soup. If you want to drink soup, you've got to drink it in its particularity. You cannot drink the platonic form of soup. So, okay, so Judaism is down here in the particularity. That's point two. Number three, there is in Judaism, and this again, very distinctive, a rejection in the Jewish mainstream, not on the borders, but in the, in, of the voluntary embrace of suffering or poverty. With the exclusion of the Qumran sect, there are no monasteries, no convents in Judaism. There is no virtue of celibacy in Judaism. There are no holy mendicants who give away their wealth and live as paupers. And there are some remarkable statements in Judaism. We have one classic example of a person who does give up something. The Nazarite who forswears wine and all the products of grapes and doesn't have a haircut either. And the, true, and the Bible says when he comes to the end of his period of Nazarite ship, he brings a sin offering. Why does he bring a sin offering? Now the plain reading of this is obvious. He's bringing a sin offering because he's going from a high state of holiness back into ordinary life. But the rabbis read it exactly the other way around. Why is he bringing a sin offering for the sin of becoming a Nazarite in the first place? He gave up wine. God created wine. He gives it his personal chechsha sometimes. <laughs> God created wine for us to enjoy, and this man turns his back on one of God's blessings. So that rejection of rejection is very central to Judaism. Then, and, uh, and Maimonides says something so profound here. Maimonides, in the Guide of the Perplexed, talks about the perfection of the body and perfection of the soul. The perfection of the body is, you know, creating a society where you can live, earn a living, live in safety. The perfection of the soul is something we all do in the innermost recesses of our own consciousness. And Maimonides, who is a great perfection of the soul guy, it says, nonetheless, perfection of the body takes priority because you don't believe that if you're sick or you're hungry or you're homeless, you can think noble thoughts about God. Poverty humiliates. 
And that is a very Jewish approach, very different from other religions. In order to be able to have the higher spiritual achievements, your basic human needs need to be satisfied. And that's why Judaism from the very earliest days and always throughout all the diaspora had its own voluntary welfare state, which made sure that no one lived at the extremes of poverty. Then, of course, we uh, have uh, uh, David's point, which is very often life is boring. You know, and, and it is a matter of taking the kids to school, or, or it would be if I ever took the kids to school. I learned, I especially learned not to be able to drive in order to, anyway. And, and here I would say, David, one of the most glorious things of Judaism is the way I call it the poetry of the everyday. You know, when, you, when, you, when food comes with its aura of sanctity, the whole laws of kashrut, when, 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 when on Shabbat, you know, you take a simple glass of wine and, and two loaves of bread and you welcome the divine presence, you know, to share it with you. When you sing a hymn of praise to the woman of the family, when you bless your children, Judaism etches the quotidian with the charisma of sanctity. And that is what we call halakha. It's there in the Bible. It's that way in which we made the home the locus of so many of our important ceremonies and rituals, not the synagogue. And that, I think, the poetry of the everyday is what makes the boring, nonetheless, happy-making. And that, that's very important. And then I mentioned the Sabbath. This, too, is important for societal happiness. Read the classical writers on Judaism. The Greek and Roman writers who wrote about Judaism were scathing about one institution above all, the Sabbath. They couldn't work out the Sabbath. What is this Sabbath? Jews are lazy. That's what they said. That's it. They couldn't believe. Greeks, everyone knows what is a holy day. Everyone knows that. But a holy day whose holiness consists in the fact that you don't work, that they didn't understand. The Talmud says, and I, have no, I never checked this, somebody here will know, the Talmud says that when the scholars, you know, in the letter of Aristeas gathered together those 72 or 70 scholars to translate the Bible into Greek, uh, the Septuagint, they deliberately changed certain sentences that they thought would be unintelligible in Greek. And according to the Gemara and the Megillah, if I'm not mistaken, one of those was the sentence, on the seventh day, God completed the work which he had done. And instead they wrote on the sixth day. Because they didn't think a Greek could understand that Sabbath is itself a creation. Now, it is interesting that Greece and Rome declined and fell with remarkable rapidity. And Jews and Judaism are still here. And the, re yeah, and the reason is that just like individuals, civilizations can suffer from burnout. And the Sabbath is the antidote to that. And that is why the Sabbath is societal happiness at its very best. Go to Jerusalem on a Sabbath morning, breathe the quiet. Understand that on the Sabbath, where there's no working, no shopping, no driving, we're all enjoying God's world on equal terms. Shabbat is civic time the way a wonderful park is civic space. It's beautiful and we all enjoy it on equal terms. That is part of societal happiness. Then gratitude, you will know from the famous so-called nuns study, uh, which began in the University of Minnesota, I don't know where it began, where, where it followed up. But this was looking at a number of nuns who at the age of 20 or so had written on their entrance as novitiates their own autobiography in their own words. And 60 years later, they found that those who expressed at the age of 20 the, most, uh, gra the greatest gratitude, thankfulness for life, were the ones who lived longer or longest. And that is one of the great things about religion in general. It teaches you gratitude. 
I think in one longitudinal study they discovered that uh, people who go regularly to a house of worship live seven years longer than those who don't. Or as I said to Elaine, maybe it just seems seven years longer. <laughs> When a Jew gets up, he or she says a whole litany of blessings. Thank you, God, for giving me back life. Thank you, God, for the cock crow who woke me up in the morning and I threw something at it. Thank you, God, for when I put my foot down, you create some ground for it to stand on. All the rest of it, everything you can thank God for, we thank God for every day. And that, uh, every item of food, every item of drink, we thank God. We do, uh, uh, it was... Heidegger is not my favorite person who said thinking is thanking and that is true in Judaism so there is the gratitude and then um, and all of these things and then all of those things are embodied in Jewish law and the result of which is to create what Aaron Lichtenstein calls societal beatitude um, I would just add uh, two other elements One that has become highly significant today with the, um, with, the, uh, 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 with the spread of the angry atheists. You have some in America. We have most of them in Britain. Or we, we exported some to you. We sent you Christopher Hitchens. We kept Richard Dawkins in case we felt lonely. And, uh, you know, the angry atheist, what I call the intellectual equivalent of road rage. Anyway. <laughs> And the essence of the angry atheists, uh, here we are in a universe that is meaningless. We, 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 we are an irrelevant speck on a minor third-rate planet. And, and in case we thought there was anything special about us, uh, Stephen Hawking and Ed Al think there are a billion infinity of other parallel universes. We are totally insignificant. We are, we are born, we live, we die, and it is as if we had never been. We are dust on the surface of infinity. At the end of the day, to con contemplate the meaninglessness of the universe condemns you to an Epicurean morality. And I don't recommend an Epicurean morality because its lifespan was one century. I mean, Epicurus, well, it was revived by Lucretius, but one way or another, a society that has gone Epicurean as a society on the brink of decline. In Judaism, we believe there is meaning. We matter in the scheme of things. That is what Viktor Frankl discovered in Auschwitz, quoting Nietzsche, those who have a why can survive any how. Those who feel a sense of divine presence, a task, a call, a vocation, a mission, can sustain the will to live even at the gates of hell on earth. And that sense of belonging happens with special power in the Abrahamic monotheisms. It begins with God's call to Abraham, and it is there in Maimonides who codifies the view of the rabbis that each of us should consider at every moment that the fate of the world will be dependent on how we choose our next action. If there's one thing Abrahamic monotheisms do, it is attach significance to the individual life. And finally, the point at which we really converge with the Dalai Lama, which is hope, that last great dimension of happiness. There is a direct contrast between the Greek concepts of ananke and moira, an inexorable fate on the one hand, and the Jewish concepts of freedom, responsibility, repentance, forgiveness on the other. Do we face a closed or open future? Those cultures that believe in inexorable fate write tragedies. They produce a Sophocles, an Aeschylus, geniuses, but they write tragedies. Those cultures that believe in choice and forgiveness that don't even understand the word tragedy. For a people that suffered more than most, you will be surprised to know that in Hebrew there is no word for tragedy. And when modern Hebrew wanted it, it had to borrow tragedia. Why? Because Judaism and doubtless Christianity likewise are the principled defeat, refutation of tragedy in the name 
of hope. And that, I think, is the final point of happiness. So I hope I've given you an idea now of three kinds of happiness, three strands in a very complex picture in Judaism. Happiness is struggle. Let's call that prophetic happiness. Number two, happiness is peace. Let's call that wisdom happiness. And happiness as the thing we share, let's call that covenantal happiness. And I think that is enough, at least, to begin a conversation. But let us end uh, by saying, you know, let us have this conversation because it matters. And it matters because only if we know where we want to get in our lives do we stand any chance of getting there. So let me finally end with my favorite story of all time on just this point, and it makes me happy. Here it is. My hero, philosophically, Ludwig Wittgenstein, the late Professor David Dauber, Regis Professor of Roman Law, once told me that Wittgenstein, I told Dauber, he said, what are you doing? I was a student at the time. He said, I said, I'm studying philosophy. Dauber said, uh, Dauber said, uh, terrible thing, philosophy. Philosophers are so, you know, they're so up in the air with their own things, they never know what day of the week it is, it's terrible, give up philosophy immediately. And he told me the following story. The Wittgenstein was standing at the Oxford station waiting for the London train with two of his disciples, H.L.A. Hart, the Prof. Jurisprudence, and Elizabeth Anscombe, and they were so immersed in metaphysical conversation that they entirely failed to notice the train as it steamed into the station, and as people were getting off, and so on, and it was only as the train was leaving the station, they looked up, and they saw the train. And as Dauber told it, uh, Professor Hart ran and heaved himself on board, and Elizabeth Anscombe, an enormous woman, ran and heaved herself on board, and Wittgenstein ran, but could not catch up with the train and was standing there as it steamed out of the station. And he was looking so crestfallen that people came up, to, so a lady saw him and took pity on him and said, don't worry, there'll be another train in an hour's time. And he looked at her and said, but you don't understand, they came to see me off. <laughs> Thank you.